Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I really feel like it's coming home. It's really wonderful to see everyone and, uh, and I have a lot of meetings and um, I'm very excited. And I just want to apologize. So I was Joe's first student. So I'm, uh, it was fantastic for me. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I had a meeting yesterday with some students and, and I was asking not only Joe students, but I was asking everyone like, what, you know, what advice would you give your advisors um, about in interaction? And everyone basically said, you're too nice and everyone is too co constructive and wonderful, so you're doing it right. That's great. <laughs> Don't change, even though they ask you to know. Um, so uh, I decided when I was thinking of, of what to talk about, I thought I would actually focus on something that a lot of people don't know from my time here um, at Princeton because I was working and still continue to work embedded within the Atacama Cosmology Telescope collaboration and now the Simons Observatory. So I do a lot of fun CMB um, analysis and action cosmology. I'll talk a little bit about that at Book Hall Lunch. But I thought I would focus on some of my um, LSST work because there's a lot of stuff happening in supernova cosmology, uh, some of which you may know, some of which you don't. And so I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of all the things that we're doing, hopefully to get you excited about some of the challenges. And I gave it a ch cheesy title because uh, why not? OK, um, I won't sing, I promise. Um, so this is sort of summarizing what I just said. We have um, in this awesome uh, uh, slide made by Colin Hill, we have, uh, you know, I'm interested in cosmology really on all scales. Um, and I'm lucky to be able to do cosmology on all scales, but I'm going to be focusing on um, LSST science, uh, which is basically trying to understand the problem of dark energy. And this is really fitting, but I thought I would, I use this in all my talks, but it makes the most sense here. So in 2012, seven years ago, Hurricane Sandy happened. Um, I was in Princeton, and in fact, um, I'm foreign, and I didn't know that you shouldn't use an open gas oven to heat your house because you can kill yourself. But I was, I was doing that to remain warm. We came to the Institute um, uh, to have some internet. Um, but this is a photo taken in Lower Manhattan um, by an artist, Jared Levy, when the streetlights were all out. And I like this because it is uh, far better than those candles that people always show as an illustration of the, the standard, standard light, light bulb in the universe, right? If you are a city dweller, you know if the lamps are bright, don't cross the road, you will get killed. If the lamps are dim, the car is far away and you're fine. But it re relies on this, the fact that they are standards. It relies on the fact that each light bulb is put in the car with the same intrinsic brightness. Um, and so uh, this is much more of a kind of city dweller's uh, uh, standard candle. And a lot of the work that we do is um, understanding how to use these objects for cosmology. Um, there are folks that actually do the modeling of the uh, change in brightness of supernovae with time and the different populations. But as we build up larger and larger statistics, we need to start differentiating between these um, useful lamp shades and different and more exotic uh, lights that you might find in a city. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, a range of different projects that are related to this uh, pro problem of supernova cosmology. The first is just how do we classify these objects in the photometric and you know, data deluge era? Um, I'll then talk about how we use some of those algorithms to try and do better job or, or plan better for how to use our follow-up resources that we know we will use with LSST. Um, because traditionally, telescopes, um, say in the SDSS era, telescopes um, that do follow-up of supernovae detected with a, with a survey have targeted one particular subtype. And that's useful if you care only about that subtype, but it actually doesn't teach you a lot about contamination. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about... Um, why I care about this at all and how we fold this into photometric supernova cosmology analysis. And then finally, just in case you have optimism, I will remind you that things are very hard on the st systematic as well as the statistical side. And I put those slides in so that Robert can kick me out of the room. OK. Uh, so uh, basically, this is LSST Dark Energy Science Collaboration um, Science in one nutshell in this awesome infographic from, from Dan Skolnick. And the key thing about LSST science is that we'll have um, the wide fields um, and small deep drilling fields uh, that will enable us to do kind of systematic analyses of, uh, of supernovae and we expect the sampling of these fields to be much, um, much more frequent and so we can build up a picture of the detailed light curves but we know that we're going to get a lot of supernovae from the wide fast deep um, survey area. Um, you know, conservatively between 300,000 to 500,000, um, even if you make cuts on quality. And so we need to understand how to use those data to understand systematics and also use them just in general to do cosmology. Uh, put another way, this is a, a collaboration uh, of um, a bunch of different supernova surveys, including SDSS and PANSTARS, 
um, and LSST will, will fill in this gap um, in the, in the mid-range uh, going up to uh, not the, not, uh, basically around redshift 1 and redshift 1. Okay, so that's excellent. And we typically have been focusing on supernovae, imagining them as some homogeneous population that we're going to get delivered to us, um, which is great. But typically when you think about a light curve of a supernova, you, at least I, um, didn't ima I imagined them to be very easy to tell from each other. Um, but you can imagine, so this is an example of something we'd expect from something like LSST. There are gaps in the data, um, the, uh, both uh, long gaps, sort of seasonal gaps, and then interday gaps as well. And you can imagine, okay, the light curve can either brighten and then fade periodically, I mean, uh, just as a transient, or you can have some sort of variability. Um, and the variability can either be uh, something that's easy to predict or is something uh, more stochastic. And so suddenly it becomes much harder to tell different objects apart. And we wanted to ask the question, given realistic LSST conditions, can we bring together part of the community, different parts of the community that had typically focused on transient science on their own um, and, and make a data set that would be useful going forward so that uh, folks can actually co co compete um, between understanding their own models compa compared to other models. Oops. Uh, so uh, the way I did this was I assembled a great team of people who uh, would work really hard on some of the nitty gritty <laughs> aspects of this and I picked a terrible acronym. Actually, I didn't pick it. I'm going to blame uh, some other members of my team, but I wholly endorsed it. It is the Photometric LSST Astronomical <laughs> Time Series Classification Challenge or plastic. It has two C's and you would think that they would help you on the internet. It really doesn't. It's very hard to find. Um, <laughs> Um, I also highlight there are uh, four people on this list that are on the job market and there are photos of them as well. So we have me Dai, who's at Rutgers, Cara Panda who's currently um, at Berkeley, Daniel Mutakrishna who's in Cambridge um, and Tina Peters, uh, my postdoc is in, in um, Toronto. And we had a couple of goals. So the classification challenges have existed in the past. The last one happened about 10 years ago um, but they were uh, sort of in the context of previous surveys like the dark energy survey and they were run by supernova folks who care a lot about this problem. And they said, let's bring together you know, a few supernova models um, and simulate the DES sky. Um, we knew we wanted to do more with this, particularly because we can't keep pretending that the only things that brighten and fade in the sky are supernovae. Um, and so we assembled a, a large suite of models. We put a call out to the community and we said, if you have a transient or a variable model, please let us know. Um, and we had models from you know, type 1S supernova, supernovae, core collapse models, both uh, conglomeration of um, observations that had been uh, sort of smoothed over, so template-based models. We also had folks that did, did sort of PCA decomposition of models, um, uh, Kilonovi uh, uh, templates, AGNs, RLIRI. Um, for my sins, I worked with a student and put in um, Myra variables. I'm ashamed to say that the easiest object to classify was my, my Myra variable model, which was just a conglomeration of different spectra, and turns out when you only have five spectral models, it's easy to tell them apart. Um, um, and then we had some theoretical models as well, including uh, Michael Enzing events and calcium rich transients, pair instability, supernovae, um, that we weren't necessarily sure we would see, but we wanted to make sure we brought together all people's, uh, all of their models. I should also say that if you, if you don't see the model that you want here, Plastic is ongoing, and in fact, we're going to release a version two um, in the coming year, probably in 2020, as opposed to the coming months. And so this was a great way, in fact, to galvanize the community even further because people were like, wait, this, my model wasn't on here. Let's, let's update that because um, uh, th we want to make sure that we have rich, as rich a data set as we can. So here, mm. Are you putting in an explicit model for the relative number of each of these? So yes. So we, have, we asked for rates. We asked for you know, the full um, spectral or photometric information. And rates, of course, does come with fudge factors. Similarly, we just asked people for, you know, if it was a galactic um, object, you know, what, what is a function of galactic coordinates, what would be your distribution, um, and for the others, we kind of just put them in randomly. So there are some assumptions that we made, and tilde, we can improve those. But uh, So here's just a picture of what they look like. These are the perfect models, so, you know, sampled in, in um, uh, completely finely in all, in all days. And... Um, uh, the aim was to then simulate these within LSST for different cadences. We picked one, but, but you can imagine doing it um, for a bunch. And it, I should say that, as a side note, one of my reasons for doing this was basically just to make the community get together. 
And these models are now available, even if you don't take the LSST simulations, the models themselves are available in the correct format publicly. So you can actually just take these models and, and run with them. Um, uh, right, OK. So we had uh, a suite of these models. And one of the key criticisms of previous challenges is uh, people would run their classification algorithms on the data. And they would say, well, look, if I train my classification algorithm, whether it's you know, machine learning or some template-based uh, method, if I train it on the data, the data you give me from the new survey doesn't look anything like my training data, and I do very poorly. I was one of those people who wrote a paper complaining about the non-representativity between training and test data. Um, and so we decided to make that the biggest feature of the new challenge, because that is what nature will give us. So rather than doing a better job of making training and test balanced, we made them wholly unbalanced, very, very unbalanced, both in number of objects, but also in their redshift distribution. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, so here are some of these cool proposed models. And I'll, I'll, t I'll talk a little bit more about them in a second. Um, so how did we do this? Very, very briefly, this is a slide from Rick Kessler. Um, we asked people to either give an SED, uh, mainly to give an SED, so time sampled and um, in all the, um, in the full ACD over a wide uh, wavelength range, and then we observed it with LSST. Um, this is useful then because if you want to actually simulate your other survey, you can still do that with these models. You're not restricted to LSST. Um, we added, we um, added peculiar velocities if, if necessary. We redshifted the objects, added extinction, and then added information from LSST, so in terms of the noise properties and the observing strategy. Um, and then we applied a trigger algorithm because the this, this is the assumption, the assumption made is that these objects are found via some difference imaging um, and, and so they have criteria for selection that we decided to enforce. So if you had an interesting model that was super faint, it didn't make it through um, yeah, to the final data set. Okay. So we, we got more than a million new SEDs across several models um, and this ended up in five, so 15 final classes. Um, importantly, uh, one type of object uh, which actually was made up of four of those interesting models, was not in the training data set. Because we wanted to make sure that astronomers were at least thinking about how they would do anomaly detection. Can you just tell me if you've seen something that you haven't seen before? Um, because we know that we'll get that, right? We didn't necessarily know what the template for Kilanova was until we found one. And so we want to make sure that we're robust against that kind of, um, of data. And so we had 8,000 objects in the training set. And we assumed that some of those had spectra from something like a ground-based follow-up um, campaign. And we had 3.5 million objects in the test set. So very, very unbalanced. And the, t and the test set had these extra objects in them. OK. The data, I should say, the data are available um, online. We've released the full um, gigabytes of data on Zenodo. And the models are, of course, in this uh, paper by, led by Rick Kessler, who did a lot of the heavy lifting, particularly on the SNANA simulation side. Um, OK. but. The biggest fear I had for four months in 2018 was that I would release this data challenge publicly and it would all be classified within 24 hours because that would be very embarrassing um, given all this work. And one of the things that we had to do to make sure that didn't happen was do a lot of validation tests. As an anecdote, um, uh, so we ran this uh, challenge on Kaggle and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but there was a visual classification challenge that was run a couple of uh, years ago. And what happened is the folks did the training and then released the test data. And all the data was classified perfectly within tw 24 hours because the test data was just the training data that had been shifted by a couple of pixels. Mm -hmm. They had made some terrible mistake. They had to recall the challenge and actually generate correct uh, test data. And so that was my fear uh, forever. And so a lot of what the team and I did was, was validating the data. Because even though you test it from models that make sense, lots of things can happen. Um, and so we had a bunch of different tests. We, we worked with the modelers to say, like, is this the distribution that you expect of objects as a function of redshift? Um, do you have uh, do the light curves look correct or not? Um, are the flux, uh, you know, have we saturated when we shouldn't? Um, or, or how do we handle those things? I'm not going to go through um, all of the tests that we did because you can, um, uh, that's not the main thrust. But you can see something like this. We had a, um, a, um, a model that didn't seem to, to match. And we went to the modelers and we said, look, it, this doesn't mean ma seem to match data that you said you used to make your model. Is this realistic? Are you happy with this or not? And similarly, we looked for correlations. You wouldn't want to simulate all of your blocks of models one after the other and then have the random ID correlate with the type. That would be a trivial way to classify the data. Um, and so some correlations make sense. You would expect you know, galactic or non-galactic to uh, correlate with redshift as a parameter. But we wouldn't want to add in spurious correlations that didn't exist. So we passed all of those tests. And um, uh, 
uh, and was able to, oh yeah, and some models were just weird. Okay. Um, okay, so we decided to work with Kaggle. So Kaggle is a data science um, company that was bought by Google. Um, and the reason why we decided to go with Kaggle rather than just put it on some website is we already knew what astronomers had tried. And that was great, but we wanted to see if we could inject some, some new um, attempts at classification or new algorithms from the community. And so we, uh, we worked with Kaggle. Interestingly enough, we initially approached them. They got super excited by the challenge and decided not only to waive the fee of working with them, but they gave us $25,000 of prize money, which is excellent. Uh, they didn't give me $25,000 <laughs> in prize money. Um, and I was actually barred, and uh, not only was I barred from participating in the challenge, but I was barred from hiring anyone who won the challenge because they have like a non-compete clause if you use it as hiring. And so I was representing the University of Toronto. Um, the person who won, so lots, most people who participated in the challenge were not astronomers. The person who won was an astronomer. Kyle Boone was finishing his PhD at Berkeley and, and was writing applications and wanted something to distract him. Um, and so found out, he started doing the challenge and then found out that he did it slightly better than he thought he would do and then quickly raced and finished and won. So, um, so I can't hire him, but um, the University of Washington did. Um, <laughs> so one of the things we needed to do was to make the data accessible to people that didn't have an astronomy background, which sounds silly, but there are lots of things that we know. I mean, maybe it doesn't sound so silly if you have a PhD, but there are lots of things that we know that the community doesn't know about astronomy. Um, there, and, and Kaggle um, suggests that you make this as public as possible. So we have a, a GitHub little repository, which is actually very neat. It just explains things like light curves, redshift, etc., but also shows what classification algorithms we had tried. So there's a little mini classifier where you can run on a tiny bit of our data to see how everything works. Um, and that was very useful. We also um, had this public facing website. I should say that the data are still there. And in fact, you can still submit your answers. You don't get any money, but you can still see where you would be on the leaderboard. Um, we also were assigned a data scientist, which was great, but because we'd done all this validation, the data science basically had nothing to do, which was excellent. He kept on suggesting tests that we had already passed, which was great. Um, and in the end, we had 1,094 teams of people participate, which we totally did not expect. There was a huge response from the community. And interestingly enough, and I think this is a model potentially for academia, there was a lot of discussion on the, leader on the discussion board. So what it looked like was you had um, a leaderboard like this, and the data were evaluated so you could submit your results a finite number of times, total times, um, and you got a score. And this was done on the public one-third of the data. We had a private leaderboard which showed the private two-thirds of the, the data that would actually be used to score the challenge. And in fact, the last 24 hours were very emotional for me because one guy didn't know that he was about to slip out of the money. Um, uh, it was very stressful. But, but um, this public leaderboard uh, uh, you know, is public. And also, so here you see, this is like, this is a big shakeup. Anyway, um, it's fine. <laughs> um, so this is the score. So we designed a metric, which I'll talk about in a little bit of uh, a second. And you notice, so first of all, um, you see everyone is training towards a low score. Low score means you win. I've highlighted the three winners and just how they progressed. And some people try interesting things and do badly and then you know, fix it. Um, but interestingly enough, I hope I have some of these discussions. Yeah, we had a lot of discussions. So someone released publicly on the kernel their um, initial Gaussian process regression. And suddenly, everyone did a lot better. Um, so you see a, you know, a decrease in scores. Um, then someone else would say, oh, like, why is Richard so important? Interesting enough, we were warned by the Kaggle team that they will try and, and exploit your kindness and just try and game you. And I had to sit on my hands for two weeks because people would ask questions that if I answered it in any way, I would give away the, you know, I'd make it too easy. But luckily having an astronomer like Kyle in the group actually helped because he could say things that I wasn't allowed to say that actually helped people. So initially people were, you know, interested like if I take the flux and I square it or I do, you know, how do I find features that would help me do this classification? Um, and so as they find out more information, all, everyone does a little bit better. Um, and uh, the, one of the interesting things that happened was this class 99. So we took those four theoretical objects, the microlensing, the CART, the parent stability supernovae, um, and we combined them into this new class. And we just said to people, can you label this as class 99, even if you don't give us, um, you don't have any more information? Because I hoped we would learn something about anomaly detection. I, was, I learned something about humans. <laughs> So basically what people did is everyone struggled with Class 99 and most people's answer was to cheat. So this was the one thing with, where people could play the, play the leaderboard. So they would make a guess of what Class 99 was by some averaging of, pro of probabilities of other classes. Like it's going to be, I'm going to take the probability of 
a 1A and the probability of an AGN and probability of something else, and I'm going to like average them in some way and, and predict class 99. And they would just try this strategy and see how their position on the leaderboard changed. So they used this as a discriminating tactic to like guess. You know when a student asks you a question and then watches what your face does? <laughs> and then if you get sad, they say something else. And, then, um, and so th this is unfortunate. I mean, the nice thing about this data set is it exists for you to do anomaly detection. But um, even, even Kyle, even the astronomers, didn't really do anomaly detection. Uh, and that there limits to how many times you can submit? There were limits within a, a sort of 24-hour period as to how many you could admit. And at the end, those, those limits became very important. So you'll notice people are like, I have one more commit before the end. Um, uh, and then overall, I think there was also a limit on, you could combine teams, but there was a limit as the final date by which you could combine teams. So we tried, they tried to restrict them. Um, the thing I wanted to say about the community that was really interesting is folks were much more, they shared much more information than, with each other than we did, even though they were competing. I was surprised at how much code was shared and discussion was shared along the way. And if you actually just go and read the leaderboard, it's super interesting uh, to see how people uh, compete. Maybe this is just because the, the stakes are lower, but um, for a three-week competition to win $8,000, the stakes aren't zero. <laughs> um, and so I was surprised at how people were just really um, engaged and, and discuss discursive. Um, so basically what happened is people would download the data, try some things, ask some questions on the, um, on the leaderboard, share some ideas, and then iterate. And these discussions ramped up a lot towards the end, um, as people at the beginning and, and towards the end. Um, I won't go into too much detail. The, the paper that summarizes the results is ongoing. I need to stop traveling and finish writing it. Um, but I will just talk a little bit about some things that we learned. The first thing that we did is we had to find a way to evaluate them. And in order to do that, so Kaggle had one condition. They said you can ask one science question and you can have one answer. So we wanted to do things like say you get extra points if you can classify it within the first few days. And do you do better at, you know, overall at extra galactic versus galactic objects or whatever. Um, but they said you can have one answer, and that's how we will evaluate that. So we had to come up with one metric. Um, and so we did a bit of an investigation of metrics and also how to evaluate between different kinds. And so this paper was led by Alex Maltz, who was um, at NYU with David Hogg and is now in Germany. Um, but we decided to, to sort of simulate ways you could make, uh, you could get it wrong. So for example, you can either say you don't know anything, um, you do a perfect job of classifying, um, here, you're only good at classifying, say, type 1As, but you really don't know anything about any other transient. Or, kilonova are so important to you, you figure you might as well classify everything as a kilonova in the hope that you're right. So this is what we call cru <laughs> cruise control. This is like, yeah, answer everything as A, right? Um, and these are, these are potentially the most interesting. So we call them subsuming, but basically, um, you might uh, confuse me for Robert, but only in one way. If you see me, you might think I, I look like Robert, but if you see Robert, you don't think he looks like me. Um, or you could do mutually subsuming, where you can't tell the difference between either of us, which happens a lot. Um, <laughs> it's the accent. That's why, you do your hair. that's why I changed my hair. No, that's exactly correct. And the shoes. It's just the hair and the shoes. Um, and so those are the types where, where you can imagine that sort of interesting physics um, is happening. And we wanted to be able to test that. So we talked about ways you know, where you could systematically be pathological in your classification. And then we knew that you'd have some combination of that. So we decided to make algorithms where we could draw from these types of classifications. And interestingly enough, this is one of the prediction uh, confusion matrices. So I should say the confusion matrix, sorry, I didn't explain it. This is the true label is what the object actually was, and this is what you thought it was, right? Um, and so this is Kyle Boone's winning uh, confusion matrix, where we've separated them into uh, um, kind of extragalactic and galactic objects. And you see there is some of the structure there. Interestingly, like this is the other class, so you can see no one did very well here. Um, but here's the, here's the Myra. Everyone knew how to classify it very easily. Um, and so what we decided to do is come up with, uh, to use a, a metric that's, that's pretty standard, which was this log loss uh, weighted metric. So basically, um, I, I have a, um, a sort of a, weight, a weighting, which allows me to weight by the number of objects in the class, because I should say that too. If you know that the majority of the objects in the sample are going to be supernovae, I don't want to give you a good score just because you did well in supernovae. The whole point is we want it to be agnostic to the science case, um, so that if you have to be, you have to do pretty well on, um, on modeling everything. Um, and so I basically, you can, you can imagine doing a, f a few things. The either is just saying, you know, what is the, the kind of weighted uh, uh, product of your or likelihoods across uh, the metrics, or you can imagine doing some sort of distance between the truth and what you thought it was. Um, and the, the important thing about this, too, is we wanted to include, be able to had, have probabilistic classifications, too. Um, 
oh, this is an example. So this is a comparison between Kyle's confusion matrix and one of the folks who came in uh, next. And you'll see that this is where I think some of his d domain knowledge helped because they did a lot worse at confusing things like one BCs and type, type 1As. OK, so uh, the winning solutions, I only mention uh, this because it's interesting to see what different people tried. So one of the key things that um, Kyle put, used to win is data augmentation, which was exactly addressing this representativity problem. The fact that he knew that the data were perfectly sampled in the training set and had been um, you know, spectroscopically confirmed, one of the things that you can do is take that light curve, randomly draw from it where you drop observations or you make the noise worse. Then you boost up your training set from that original training set, but now you have many more objects, which your machine learning classifier thinks are new because they have different noise properties, but really they come from the same underlying model. This is particularly useful if you have some classes where you have one or two or three objects and others where you have lots and lots. Um, so you can do it in the type domain and in the um, data quality domain as well. Um, uh, some folks tried um, uh, neural networks. Sometime, some people tried just uh, more deterministic, uh, sorry, uh, more uh, simple classification algorithms. But most people computationally struggled at the point where they needed to identify what was interesting, what were the features. Some people decided to just take all of our metadata and all of the light curve data um, and come up with hundreds and hundreds of features and then try to reduce the number of features at the end. But that took a lot of their time. Similarly, fitting the light curves was a problem. If you're used to using something like uh, a, a light curve fit that works really well on core collapse supernovae, uh, you just get crappy fits and then it doesn't work. If you do something like a Gaussian process, uh, that does much better, but you have to fit 3 million light curve first before you do anything. You could, use, you could use any physics you wanted, yeah. So, so some people did say, look, I have these models that I know are good fits. The problem is because we had some objects that they wouldn't have seen before, um, there was a limit to, yeah. So some people who tried only physics previously did worse than they expected. Um, OK. This is an example of the augmentation. Just So this is taken. So Kyle Boone's winning paper is actually on the archive now. Some of his results are in incorporated in our kind of comparisons. But this is what we mean by augmentation. So this is one light curve that's well sampled. And then you can, you can take some data away. And you can make the error model uh, different um, for the different types of objects. OK. So we want to c um, compare how people did on particular types of objects. Because as much as you care. If you're the winner about an overall score, if you're a scientist, you don't really care about that. You care about your objects and how you do. Um, and so the, the way we want to represent this is in these precision recall plots. I should say, caveat, I don't like how these plots look because they're kind of boring to me. But there is some instructive information that we can get about this. So on the y-axis, we've got um, precision, which is the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives and false positives. So all I want to know is if you have a positive identification of something as a 1A, how uh, you know, how precise are you? How correct are you in this case? Whereas your recall is the true positives divided by the true positives and the false negatives, um, which is slightly different uh, from something like uh, your purity, right? So the false negative is if you predict that it is something else when in fact it is a type, type 1 supernovae or whatever. And so um, the reason why this is interesting, so we want to be at the top, um, but the reason why this is interesting is the other class, you don't care, you don't care if I think something is an other, you only think if I think something else, think other is something else. I said that the wrong way around. You don't care if I think something other is something else, but what you know is how badly do I do at assuming something is an other class. And so in this case, um, the, the um, precision is very low on these types of objects. But what's interesting is you notice for some kinds of objects, you sort of tank out. So the number of times you classify something correctly and the number of times you classify something incorrectly, false positive, yeah, the ratio of those of the this, the ratio of that to the sum stays constant for certain types of objects, um, and this is something we're trying to dig into a little bit more. So this is Kyle's uh, winning classifier across a range of objects, and you'll notice the mean isn't isn't great. The mean isn't great, um, but he did particularly well um, on on some type of objects uh, where one one would hope, and did badly on things like one ABG models. Uh, for comparison, here are the others. Um, and you see there are some in the Kilanova space. Uh, Major Tom, who is one of the, the kind of second place ones, never was never particularly precise, never was particularly good at classifying them correctly. What are you varying along the curve? Normally, it's the program. What are, why are you generating curves on yeah, points? You have a classifier, and it, it gets this many seconds over a day. 
Um, so in this case, um, I think we're varying this over redshift, but I should check that. Yeah. Usually people vary over the probability that you cut off. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In this, so I, I'll show you something that gets to a little bit to this uh, to the probability case, but I think actually in this case we're varying redshift. I should double check. Um, but this sort of gets to what you're talking about in terms of a probability density. So we were interested in when do you get things wrong and kind of why. So these are violin plots where you're saying, I, this is the probability density of classifying the point correctly um, for different types of objects. So in this case, this is the, the correct object is 91 BG. Okay? And this is the probability density of classification. And this is you know, the predicted class it was. And what you're interested in here is that it it has a pretty flat probability distribution, even though the true class is 91 BG. So the objects that truly were 91 BG still are not very well classified, or uh, well the probability doesn't peak in, in anything uh, in particular, where some have a peak in a tail. Um, and importantly here, this very uh, sharp peak at ha having a probability of being an other is exactly because Kyle cheated for class 99 and made his probability of classing something as an object 99 a product of uh, the um, 1BC probability and other probabilities. So these two, that's why you get this uh, non-zero probability of being a 99 if you're a 1BC. One, one uh, so we need to dig into this a little bit more, but you can sort of start to see the fact that um, or we, you want to try and understand as a function of the light curve shape, could it be that we're putting in light curve models that don't uh, vary enough relative to other objects? Um, is it that on average, you know, the 91 BGs just don't have enough variability and we're not doing a good job? Um, or what is it about the different classifiers that give us different, you know, different values of these? So uh, one of the things that we're doing in the paper is starting to think through which classifiers do better at telling apart objects that that one does to particularly badly. Yeah? So we saw that with Kyle's results, it was a little disappointing with the one name and other record model. Right. But were there any other people who put in contributions who did well in distinguishing those classes and maybe failed because of not doing well with other <coughs> Um So at least in the top few, in the top leaderboards, they didn't do, most people didn't do well at the things we expected them to, which is the one I, so if we go back, right, to the, um, these folks did even worse, right? So this is Kyle, where the one is uh, here, right? And here are the others, so this is the confusion that you're talking about between 1AX and, and type twos, and the others do even worse. Yeah. So um, Kyle has, privately made a statement that he don't, doesn't think he would have won if he didn't do so well in the 1As because everyone did a lot worse than we expected, which is great, but um, there's more to do. Uh, okay. So, uh, so this challenge data exists, and I, mean, I encourage you to take the classification approaches that you have and run it through uh, these data because I think there's a lot of rich things we can explore. The next version of the plastic challenge will be partly to update the models, so contact me if you want to update the models, but also to, to iterate towards what we think LSST will give us. This was just a catalog where we gave you an object and we simulated them randomly, but we know that uh, supernovae sit in galaxies. And so the thing to do next is include um, parameters of the host galaxies. Make sure that the redshifts are actually realistic. We just added some photos E model rather than actually putting them in redshifts, getting magnitudes for the galaxies and fitting for photos E. So, so the next step will be a more rich catalog that will be closer to providing us information we would get from LSST. And then we'll be able to answer the, the question of, can we actually do early classification? Um, so what we would do is map it onto what we think LSST will provide. So that you're right, that there will be some, we'll have to be careful that we don't use a bunch of stuff that no one will ever be able to use themselves. Like we have to be careful. In that sense, but yeah, you're basically just going to get get the information, um, yeah, distance to nearest host properties of the host, yeah. Okay. Yes. What's the best you could possibly do uh, for this data set? In other words, if you remove information and added noise, it might be that two objects are indistinguishable given the signal that you have. Is that a possibility that do you know theoretically that there should be a classifier that exists that would get this perfectly correct? 
That's a great question. I don't, um, I don't know. That doesn't mean there isn't one. Um, yeah, but that's, that's a very good test, right? Just take away all the variables and just say if we throw everything at it. I mean, you know, we have shown that as you iterate closer and closer to a perfect s sample, you do pretty well. But that's not, yeah. We could do that. Yeah. Um, OK, so I'm going, uh, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit, which is saying, this is great. You have a data set you can classify. So what, right? One of the things we want to do is build up a sample of useful objects that we can use to do both cosmology, but also uh, um, other science with transients. And so something that I'm working on right now is to use this plastic data um, to try and optimize our spectroscopic resources. So this is a paper from uh, one of the white papers that we submitted about LSST spectroscopic follow-up. And um, assuming that we have, <coughs> please give it to us, some time on PFS um, to do follow-up of the deep fields, and then some time on foremost, which is a wide uh, survey. Um, and assuming like 80% efficiency, um, uh, what, how would our, of, of the telescope, um, how well would our efficiency um, at following up supernovae be? Um, and so this is assuming that we only have you know, type 1As in the final sample. But there are lots of objects that we need uh, to follow up and to get redshifts of the host, um, but also to do live, uh, uh, get live information about the sources. And so um, what I'm working with my student Connor and with Tina Peters is to um, implement an active learning prescription. So instead of doing the standard thing, which is I have a training set, and I train on all my data, and then I get a new object in, and I classify it. You could ask, what if I start with a smaller training set, and then I augment it as I get more information? And what we're trying to do um, is, is uh, simulate the, how well we would do that, and uh, if, including information about spectroscopic cost functions. Um, so again, you do some kind of Gaussian process fit. Um, you get some parameters in your light curve, like the maximum magnitude, the difference between the maximum and, and some average, or some, you know, the time to rise. You try to come up with features from these light curves that might help you in classify, classifying the objects. Um, and then you start to make decisions. Imagine I get a classification of this new object, and I get a bunch of probabilities. A probability that's a 1A, a type 2, 1BC. And now I want to say, do I take a spectrum of that object? Do I tell my ground-based uh, spectroscopic instrument to go and take a spectrum? Well, I could either say the current mode, which is the, I will take a spectrum of the object that is most likely a 1A, because I care about 1A cosmology. And that's useful, but you don't then learn about any of your contaminant probability, your, your contaminant distributions. So instead, you could say, let me take a spectrum of the object that I'm most likely to confuse with a 1A. So the object that is the lowest probability relative to um, the, the 1A probability. And then I take a spectrum. In this case, it just means give me the label, because we're still simulating data. And then you augment your training data, and you start again. Um, and so this process has already been run. So um, Emily Yoshida, uh, who's not a photo of her, Emily Yoshida uh, did this on the, one of the previous challenges um, for three different types of objects. And now we're trying to extend that uh, to handle the plastic data. And this is interesting because suddenly you can ask, you know, if I really care about kilonovia, I don't care about supernovia at all, um, how do I change that strategy um, with time um, to, to try and understand different population statistics? Right, so in this case, we're agnostic, right? In this, the way I've described it here, I'm presenting different ways, different boundaries. You could say, I really care about getting the most complete 1A sample. So then you would say, uh, I follow up you know, the 1A object. Or I could say, I really want to understand, in this subset of, of objects, I want to understand the um, contamination, confusion between core collapse and supernovae as a function of redshift. Or you say, no, I care about kilonovae only. So in this prescription, it's, you can change the cost function. You, d you can't change it you know, too often within one, uh, one strategy. But you could say, I care about kilonovae. Always follow up the object that's most likely to be a kilonova. So what we're doing is we're taking what previously had happened, which is give me the most complete 1A sample. And we're now making that something that you can change adaptively. The reason why this is important is because you can now say, um, you can ask as a function of time, as a function of augmenting my trader sets, when do I have enough data that I don't actually need to do spectroscopic follow-up anymore? Yeah, so in this, these examples are shown for the 1A case. The purest, the largest number of 1As or the purest? The purest number of 1As, yeah. 
So you can, so here you have I purity, here you can, you know, there are different metrics that you can use to say, I want to maximize this one, for example. Um, but the reason why that's important is because we, w we know we have limited resources and we want to make sure we can uh, use them most effectively. Um, and it's, it's not always just do all the 1A. Uh, okay, so I'm running out of time. So I'm going to switch gears just uh, a little bit more. Um, and say now you don't, you don't care about objects. Uh, you don't care about other transients. You only care about cosmology, W prime, W0, WA, however you like to describe it. Wh why does this matter at all? If you have a classification probability, what do you use it for? Well, one of the things we know is that as we build larger and larger samples of objects, uh, <laughs> OK, the slide is supposed to come later. But um, once we build larger and larger samples of objects, we have to do things in a Bayesian context. OK, so, I've, so and I've, I've killed my own joke. But if I told you that I came here today on a dragon, uh, you would laugh because you think that dragons don't exist. You would be right. Um, but all of that information <coughs> is coming from your prior in the existence of dragons. If you just use the fact that I'm here, dragon or feet explains my, um, the, the fact that I'm in this room equally likely. <laughs> we don't need shoes to, to get here. Um, <laughs> actually, that, that is the difference, yeah. So, uh, so it's all your prior in, in the existence of dragons. And so I like to use that as the introduction to Bayesian analysis because then it kills all of the description or discussion between frequentist and Bayesian methods because you now know you're all Bayesian then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so this is something I've been thinking about for a while, which is how do we use probability information, so this classification probability or otherwise, to allow you to do the full Bayesian cosmology without restricting yourself to knowing that something is a 1A because I put a spectrum on it and I took, I took a spectrum of the supernovae. And we've tried different approaches. So the original incantation of this was beams where we just said, I have a redshift of everything, but I don't have a type. How do we do that? You can also make a bunch of cuts, which is fine, but eventually becomes uh, not robust. Um, and folks have started to look at this within um, existing data surveys. So this is the PanStars, PanStars data. This project was led by David Jones and others. And you can see here, you know, they have a spectroscopic uh, sample um, in green and in orange. And then you notice this is the photometric sample that they know has some contamination in it, um, but they haven't taken a spectrum of it. And you see there's more spread. But you don't want to just throw away these data because you're not entirely sure um, of what they are. The key thing that we want to incorporate is that there's redshift information. Now, this is a lot, and I have 10 minutes left, so I won't, uh, I won't go crazy. But the gist of the matter is, I want to move into a hierarchical model space where I take um, light curve parameters and I take um, host galaxy information and I can do my cosmology together. Rather than what currently happens is you get a light curve, you only do a fit in, in, in kind of model space, um, and then you get a photo Z and they're completely uncorrelated um, before you include them together. So the, the, the whole hierarchical model space is that we know we have um, Rates, we have selection hyperparameters, we have cosmology, and we have galaxy host information. And these come together to, to form this kind of joint posterior, which includes supernova information and includes host redshift information. Um, and this is work with, um, again, Alex Maltz, um, who doesn't have a photo of himself, and Tina Peters, uh, who, uh, who we're working on uh, two papers. One, just introducing the method to everyone, and then one, doing some simulations. Um, and the, the goal is, now that we have plastic, we can start including some of that information about both probability information, but also uh, the, the mu space. Now, we're used to seeing a, a Hubble diagram which has Z and mu. But actually, um, yeah, this is too much stuff. Uh, you move to having something where we take correct redshifts as according to type. But you move to having uh, essentially layers of a sheet cake, you can imagine, where the sheet cake is probability. And now I have uncertainty in the redshift dimension and in the mu dimension. And I have for each of these. Uh, uh, types of object. In this case, I'm only including three for simplicity, and we're doing a bunch of simulations rather than um, taking all of the plastic types of data. But you can imagine that uh, you would have infinite layers of, of sheet cake, and you are essentially summing over all of those dimensions in your full posterior to do things um, completely. One of the problems that you might guess is that computationally this is not um, that simple. And so one of the hurdles that we're tackling right now is making sure that by adding this complexity, which is the correct way to do it, we don't make essentially supernova cosmology intractable. <laughs> um, uh, and so that's something we're working on now just to sample the posterior correctly. Um, you can always project down 
if you wanted to make, say, a Hubble diagram, you can project down in the redshift space and the mu space. Um, and here we're showing, you know, just different kinds of um, uh, uh, visualizations of this for the different types. And you can imagine having, you know, three different colors of object on your on your Hubble diagram. Traditionally, would lead you to some of these sheet cakes. Um, so this is once we figure out the uh, the sampling problem, um, uh, expect to see some cool cosmology results here. Hopefully you realize the magnitude of the problem that faces us photometrically to do cosmology um, from all of these abundant types. Maybe you put your foot down and you say, enough. I don't care that you're doing things photometrically. I want to know what is the cosmology analysis I can do right now with LSST, assuming only type 1a supernovae, like you figured it all out, and assuming that we have host redshift information because I know that that's exactly what Robert would tell me. Like, none of this other complicated stuff, just tell me what I can do right now if I had results today. Um, and so that's what we did. Um, so the final, just to take us home, the final thing is if I throw all of the photometric stuff away, what is the supernova science we can do with cosmology with, with supernovae in the desk today? Um, and more importantly, what do I need LSST to provide me in order for me to be competitive as a stage uh, for experiment? So this is, uh, this is work that I did as part of the desk uh, to forecast you know, very simple um, cosmology. We only have 1As. We have no contamination. We uh, have host redshifts for some sample of them. So we did a spectroscopic kind of selection according to the resources we'd have from something like Foremost or, um, or uh, PFS. And I assume just this very simplest likelihood, uh, what would I get? Importantly, before anyone brings this up, because it happens in every talk, and it scared me for a very long time, um, so the green is a supernovae. You'll notice that the green is tipped in the direction against dark energy. So the first thing we did is, I thought I'd made a mistake, students. Um, if it looks wrong, you probably made a mistake. And it took a really long time to, to actually um, convince some senior people. That is basically because the tip in the wrong direction is because we haven't applied any priors on the matter density. We wanted to keep everything agnostic and apply the prior at the end. If you apply the, the prior on the matter density, you actually tilt the, the contours all the way over. So if you don't have enough matter, you don't need that much dark energy is the reason for this tip. Mm -hmm. But uh, we combined, we used all the different probes uh, separately. So we have strong lensing constraints in, in orange. We have the, um, this is the stage three prior on the densities. Um, and then we have the three cross two point shear analysis and the supernova analysis. So this is what we would get with the first year of supernova data. And this is what we would get with the 10 year supernova data which is very impressive. So we have you know, uh, uh, very extreme improvements in the figure of merit relative to today. So with that in hand, and we, with our knowledge of what our you know, figure of merit across all of the desk is, and for the supernova case on its own, we could say, now we know we'll have some systematic effects. How big are the systematic effects allowed to be if I vary things I think might be incorrect or might be systematics uh, to still keep not be dominated by systematic error. Yes? Sorry, what is the oh, sorry. This is delta WA from, error. yeah, well, it's the, the difference from, z from the standard model. We didn't want to um, basically, so the model is, the standard is zero, zero, where the standard model is minus one, zero. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what is a dark blue, the three, uh, two point correlation function? That's the weak lensing. So galaxy, galaxy, uh, galaxy shear and shear shear weak lensing. Um, three cross the three times the two point measurements, two point correlation functions. So first of all, you'll notice that supernovae are non-zero cont contributors to the overall figure of merit, which is great. But that means we have to be um, we have to be pretty uh, careful about systematics. So why are the constraints so good? Um, this kind of silly uh, diagram just shows you some dark energy models and the kinds of error bars we expect, which I just didn't couldn't conceive of until I saw this. The Y scale is millimagnitudes. So all of the plots that you've typically seen are like magnitude, half a magnitude. And so it's just going to take any Hubble diagram. Like you can't plot Hubble diagrams anymore because they just all lie on exactly on the curve. So, so it's the fact that our error bars are getting so small because you have 400,000 supernovae, um, or in this case, I think we restricted ourselves to a smaller set of something like 100, only 150,000. Um, and your error bars get so small. So. I then played another game, which is I said, I know here are three systematics um, I think uh, uh, 
then we might have. So uncertainty in our um, calibration, HST calibration of, uh, of stars, um, our uncertainty in the Milky Way extinction law, and our training of salt to um, light curve models. So typically today, uh, the way distances are predicted is by running the, the light curve data through a salt to light curve fitter to get a mu. What if you haven't trained that model on a, you know, recent data? And so the model itself is not very well constrained. Um, and so I can basically include errors in those fit parameters and that change that. And so I changed, I changed the baseline systematic where the baseline was like, say, the error in the parameters. And I ask, how bad does the systematic uncertainty need to be before I blow through my statistical error bar? Right? So the y-axis is defined as the bias I would get if I didn't control for that systematic relative to the size of the contour. Right? And I want to make sure that it's within, otherwise I'm dominated by this, the systematic. So for, um, for year one, we can do all of the cosmology we need right now. The only thing we need to do is retrain salt. Because we can't get, we, we ha basically have to get 20% of the current error on the parameters of the salt two model. For year 10, we very, 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 very importantly need to retrain salt because now we blow through. Basically, the error bars on the salt model are, are, are bad enough that they would bias our cosmology. Um, and we also have to do a much better job at um, understanding the extinction um, laws, which is not something I work on. So, um, so that's great. I haven't included here our biggest systematic, uh, potential systematic uncertainties, which is our un overall calibration, uh, so our band to band calibrations and the band-to-band -band, um, uncertainty in the wavelength, um, which, we, um, which we know will be a significant fraction of our overall systematic error bar, about 75% of our systematic error bar. Um, but we have set limits at <coughs> a millimagnitude and an angstrom. And Robert told me, if you, go less, if you ask for less than an angstrom or a millimagnitude, you're over. It's not happening. So we set it at that. Um, and so that means we have even less available, systematic available to these, uh, to these objects. So this was sobering because we know the, um, that there's a lot we need to do better at the, all the ancillary parts of modeling supernova parameters. The good thing is that this is not like we, we'll never fix this because one of the benefits of taking so many having so many supernovae is now you can actually do systematic studies with subsets of them. You don't need to use 150,000 in your cosmology. You can use a subset to really understand these, uh, these laws better and, or the, the modeling better and then uh, do the, the, you know, the full fitting on your full data set. So this has been a little bit of a whirlwind. Hopefully, um, you will all download the plastic data and please do the anomaly detection part because I'm upset that no one did that before. Um, uh, I look forward to showing you all under the hood in our validation paper all the different things that we were worried about. Um, please take a look at the metric paper. I think it's useful just in general as a way to simulate uh, uh, performance in uh, different surveys. Um, and uh, watch the space for the efficient, fast way to fully sample over both host information and uh, supernova-like curve properties uh, in the future. So thanks. <laughs>